Hello, good morning everyone. Today I will share grammar points and frequently misused words for Chinese medical writing, which is a content that is just shared uh, two days ago from Dr. Steve Vallis. And I think it's a great content where uh, Dr. Steve Vallis itself is a writing teacher and editor at NTU, NCTU, NTHU, and CUHK, which is in Taiwan and write on a 13 textbook used in 28 universities including work with 86 colleges, universities, and research institutes on writing papers and also he editing and translating in company for research papers and and he will talk mainly uh, about uh, how the, uh, the papers that we would like to submit into a journal into publishing papers uh, sometimes uh, a lot of mistake is is happened uh, not not because the content itself but more on to like the uh, our mistype or especially the grammar itself yeah so and it's very important to check like for example uh, uh Dr. Steve Wells were mentioned about the active and, and passive voices which is yeah mostly actually uh, there is a changing between uh, whether in a few years ago and and what is the uh, better for uh, recently yeah which better we use that uh, is it active voice or, or passive voices and also uh, he will also talk about like the hedging words where uh, where you should put that and in which point it is better or not and also like uh, whether it is good or not did you use uh, like word we or etc in order to uh, say what, what it's uh, to mention your research as a researcher in the paper that you write and at the end of this uh, recording also uh, Dr. Steve Ballas will give a clear explanations uh, Regarding to the uh, verb tenses in, in in tenses in the medical paper, and yet I think it's really uh, nice and it's they have a clear structures from introductions from the method until uh, the how we should write our conclusion itself, which is. Uh, how how the recommendation better with using the version or modern verbs and etc. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this recording and also uh, this recording is uh, come from www.editing.tw so you can check out more information there and also uh, you can go to uh, Dr. Steve Vallas of Facebook on uh, Wellness Academy writing uh, editing. I'm sorry. Yeah, Wellness Academic editing. So go on there and Hopefully you uh, have a great lesson from the Dr. Wellness uh, Lecture also then good luck for your papers and others Thank you When we have results that we are not 100% certain about. We want to show our doubt or we want to show approximation, you know, door, not exactly. And to do this, we must use some special words to show that we are not certain. Now, if we don't use these special words, these hedging words, our editor, our reviewer may think that this is a fact when actually it is only implication, only suggestion. And so it's very important that we use these hedging words skillfully, especially in our discussion section when we are talking about our opinion of our results. However, we have another problem when we overuse these hedging words. We use too many together. And because we use so many of these uncertain words, it looks like we know nothing at all. So it's very important to use hedging words, but not to use too many. I will give you some examples so you can understand what I'm talking about. I then want to talk about pronouns 
antecedent. Pronouns, three types of pronoun mistakes that I see in medical papers. I'll give you examples from the real medical papers as well. Very often, when you use a pronoun like it, they, them, that, which, you always know exactly what you mean because it's your paper, but nobody else knows. And that's, that's the problem with pronouns. Pronouns are very dangerous because of something we call the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge means you always know too much. So your writing always looks so beautiful to you. But your reader is not you, he does not have your knowledge, and he does not know what it means. They, them, that, which. And there are three variations of this error that I will show you how to, and how to avoid them. I will then talk about modifiers like even and only because, and almost. These are dangerous words because very often in medical papers, I see authors misplace them. They put them before the wrong word in their sentence, changing the meaning of their sentence. And I will say how these modifiers are very important to place exactly and correctly, and if you don't, you change your meaning. And then finally, I have collected a lot of misused words in medical papers. A lot of words that students, medical students, use wrongly. The meaning is not what you think it is. And I will show you what the correct meaning is, and I will show you some words I think you should just never use. Because they are so general and fuzzy that today they don't really mean anything and they should not go into our medical paper at all. Let me start with the active and passive voice. What is the active voice? The active voice is a sentence where the subject of the sentence is doing the action. Look at my example. Wind, subject, disperses plant seeds. We have the wind doing the action, dispersing the plant seeds. This is a short, active voice sentence. Here's another one. Smith, the subject, investigated the relationship. So Smith, he's doing the action, he's investigating the relationship. These are very clear, very easy to understand, and preferred in medical writing, as I will show you. Now, passive voice is when usually we do not, we, we never begin with the subject. Plant seeds are dispersed by wind. Notice, in a passive sentence, sometimes I can have no subject. It's possible to drop out the by wind, right? It's possible to have a missing subject. This is one serious problem with the passive voice. Many times, I don't know what the subject is because maybe the author forgot to put it in, or the author hid it. So often with a long passive sentence, I have to read the sentence several times. First time to find the subject, second time to try to decode what the subject is doing. So that's one reason why active voice is much clearer. The relationship was investigated by Smith. Notice the word by, the word by always comes before my subject in a passive sentence. That's one good way to find your subject in a passive sentence. Find the word by, what comes after by. The bull was hit by the man. The man is the subject. He's doing the action. He's hitting the bull. The results have been analyzed. Well, by us here. We might even drop it out. Now, I want to talk about how this preference for active and passive voice has changed in the history of science. If you go back to 1860, when Charles Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species, in Darwin's time, scientists would write first person, I, an active voice. For example, I have called this principle by the term of natural selection. Today, we don't really see I in medical papers, almost never. And we have shifted away from that. But in 1860, this is how all scientists would write. Now, starting in 1920s, 
scientists shifted away from I, no I, no we, and all passive. In fact, in 1920, 1930, if you read the medical papers, scientists will not use I, not use we. If they want to talk about themselves, they will say the researchers, even though it is very unclear who the researchers are sometimes. When you read those papers, you're like, who, which researchers? The literature review researchers or this guy? It's, it's, it is very difficult. Now, this shift to passive voice, why did this happen? Scientists believe that if we use passive voice, we are more objective, more scientific. We are less subjective by using this formal passive voice. Now, starting in the 1950s, 1960s, science began to shift back to preferring the active voice because they realized active voice is shorter and clearer than passive voice. And today, in medical writing, these are the two principles we always follow. We want to be short and we want to be clear. That's what we care about. We do not like long, complicated sentences that nobody understands. Today, we want everyone to understand, and we also don't want to use any more words than we need, than necessary, so we are short. Let's take a look at an important paper written in 1953. This is Watson and Crick's paper on DNA. Notice how Watson and Crick begin their paper. We wish to suggest a structure for the salt of dioxyromous nucleic acid DNA. Now that's amazing because even today we don't write we for the first sentence of our paper. So Watson and Crick were some of the first scientists to begin to change this preference from passive voice to active voice. And many scientists followed their example. And today in medicine, we prefer the active voice to the passive voice. However, we still disagree a little bit about whether you can use we or not. This is the tricky thing that I want to talk about. Every journal likes active voice, but not every journal likes we. So, be concerned about your introduction. Rather than say, we wish to suggest, I think you should say, this paper proposes, this research introduces. Use that as the subject, not we, and you can avoid this we problem. Now, medical journals will never complain if you use we in the discussion section of your paper. That's always fine, because in the discussion, you separate yourself from your research. So you can say we in your discussion, may one thing. We believe, in our opinion, in your discussion is fine. Outside of your discussion, I suggest you avoid we to be safe. Some journals allow, some journals don't. The problem is they don't tell you first. So just to be safe, try to use active voice, but avoid we. That's where we are now in research writing. Let's take a look at AMA, what they say regarding this. They say this is the American Medical Association, and many style guides ask you to follow AMA instructions about how to write. In general, authors should use the active voice except in instances in which the author is unknown or the interest focuses on what is acted upon. Now, AMA gives us a very good definition here. They say, number one, prefer the active voice except in two situations. Number one, when the author is unknown, when you have no subject, the passive voice is your friend. Because you can't name the subject, you must use passive voice. And number two, AMA says, when the interest focuses on what is acted upon. That is, when you don't care about the subject. So when you don't know and when you don't care, AMA says it's okay to use the passive voice. Now, when do we not care about the subject? Today, in medical writing, usually we don't care about the subject if you are the subject of your sentence. We don't want to overemphasize ourselves. Let's think about the methodology. If you write your method section, in active voice, every sentence will begin with we, right? 
we did this and we did that and we did something else. It's too much we. Emphasizing myself too much. Also, it's not really any clearer in my method. It's my method. You know it's me. I don't have to tell you it's me. Me again. Still me. We know. It's in your method. So here, by using active voice, we overemphasize ourselves. So usually, the one part of the medical paper that is passive is the method section. Introduction will be active, but we won't use we. We'll use this paper, this uh, study. The methods will be passive. The results of the discussion will be active. The discussion can use we, no problem. Other parts of our paper cannot. That's usually how we will approach this active, passive, and we throughout our medical paper. Here's the Journal of Trauma and Disassociation. In their style guide, they say, use the active voice whenever possible. We will ask authors that rely heavily on use of the passive voice to rewrite manuscripts in the active voice. Ophthalmology says, active voice is much preferred to passive voice, which should be used sparingly. That means seldom, rarely, right? They continue, passive voice does not relieve the author of direct responsibility for observations, opinions, or conclusions. For example, the problem of blood flow was investigated. They don't like that. They prefer you say, we investigated. Remember I said we don't like we? You know what we don't like even more is no subject according to this style guide. They like you to use we rather than avoid naming your subject. Or, you know what, you could say this study investigated. That would be fine here too, right? That would avoid the we problem. The Journal of Parasites. <clears throat> Overuse of the passive voice is a common problem in writing. Although the passive has its place, for example, in the method section. Remember, we just talked about that, right? We said method section will be passive so we can avoid saying we, 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 we. This journal also suggests method section passive. British Medical Journal, please write in the clear, direct, and active style, write in the active voice, and use the first person, that's we, where necessary. Now, I just told you, where can we always use we? What part of our paper? Discussion. That's right. APA, those of you in nursing, this is your style guide. Prefer the active voice. Behavioral ecology, active voice is preferable to the impersonal passive voice. Science, use active voice when suitable. Nature, nature journals like authors to write in the active voice as experience has shown that readers find concepts and results to be conveyed more clearly if written directly. I like nature's reason for preferring the active voice. Nature says you are more clear when you are direct. Remember our two goals in medical writing to be short and clear? <clears throat> nature says these are related. When you are shorter, you are clearer. And when you are clearer, you become shorter. They are related. And active voice will achieve both of those goals. As we use active voice, we shorten our sentences and become clearer. Now, I want to mention one more thing before I go to my next point. Some of you may be thinking, so I can never use passive voice? No. You can use the passive voice, and I want to show you three situations, and only three, where passive is better than active. If you're using passive voice, and it's not one of these three, you should be using active voice instead. I would think, I think outside of your method section, outside of your method section, about 80% of your sentences should be active. If you have half your sentences passive outside of your method section, you're using too much passive. Let me show you an example here of when the passive is better than the active. Number one, use the passive voice when the performer, or let's call him the subject, okay? 
when the subject of the sentence is unknown, irrelevant, that means unimportant, or obvious. Let me give you an example. Look at the first one. Up to 90% of the energy in light bulbs is wasted in the form of heat. What's the subject in this sentence? Who, who is wasting the heat? Well, I don't know, right? It's very difficult to name the agent losing the heat here. And because of that, I use past voice because my subject is unknown, right? Unknown. So when we have a sentence where the subject is unknown, we happily use our passive voice. Or number two, the first edition of Freud's earliest writings on dreams was published in 1899. Now in this sentence, who is the subject? The publisher, right? The publisher is the subject. But if we make this sentence active, we have to say the publisher published. Do we really care about the name of the publisher? Is that important? No. What we care about is the date. So to avoid this unimportant, irrelevant information, we use the passive voice. And finally, Drosphilia Madagascar has been one of the most extensively studied species in genetics research. What's the subject in this sentence? Well, researchers, actually. Researchers aren't researching Drosphilia Madagascar, but it's very obvious here because I see research and I know researchers so here, it was very obvious. So, quickly, use passive voice when nobody knows your subject or nobody cares or everybody knows. Three different situations where passive is okay, where passive may be better than active. Number two, use the passive in your method section because in your method section, the performer, you, are less important than the action, than what you do. Let me give you two examples. The honeybees were kept in a humidified chamber at room temperature overnight. Now this sentence, this sentence is passive. If I make it active, what do I have to do? I have to say, we, we kept the honeybees in a humidified chamber. Now, it's my method section, so you know it's me. It's not necessary for me to tell you. I'm not being more clear if I use we. And it overemphasizes myself. I don't want to do that in my methods. So I prefer the passive voice in my methods. Or the solution was heated. If I make this active, I have to say we heated the solution. I don't want to do that. It overemphasizes myself. So I prefer the passive in my method section. And finally, the third reason to use passive is when you're putting the important information at the beginning of the sentence. Let me show you an example here. Green plants produce carbohydrates in the presence of light and chlorophyll. Now, this is a good sentence if the most important thing is green plants. If you want to emphasize green plants. However, if your key point, if your paragraph is about carbohydrates, then you want to put the most important word as close as possible to the beginning of the sentence, and you will begin with carbohydrates. Key point, most important word, carbohydrates are produced by green plants in the presence of light and chlorophyll. But you need to think about this before you use passive voice. You really need to think, what is my key point here? Don't just use passive to use passive. It's got to be for a point, for a special reason. I have one more example of this, putting the important word at the beginning of the sentence. I'm going to go back to Watson and Crick, their DNA paper. I want to read the first three sentences because Watson and Crick skillfully use active and passive voice. And I want you to notice when they use the passive voice because it's a good example 
of putting the important information at the beginning of the sentence. They begin, we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of dioxide of nucleic acid, DNA. That's active voice, right? Second sentence is also active. This structure has novel features which are of considerable biological interest. Third sentence is passive. A structure for nucleic acid has already been proposed by Pauline and Corey. Now, why did Watson and Crick use the passive for their third sentence? <laughs> They're trying to connect a structure in sentence three with this structure in sentence two, and the structure is the most important word in sentence three. So they put it at the beginning of the sentence because it connects back to sentence two. If they wrote it passive, they would say, Pauline and Corey have already proposed a structure. It would separate the structures too much. So they've decided to use passive here. This is an example of number three, putting the important information at the beginning of the sentence. And this is a good situation of where passive would be okay here. Summarize on the passive voice. Number one, prefer the active voice. I hope you didn't forget that, right? We like the active most. 80% of the time, outside your methods, will be active. Number two, only use the passive if your subject is unknown, unimportant, obvious. Or your method section, or when you're putting the most important word at the beginning of the sentence like when you're connecting two sentences together, like Watson and Crick's paper there, where I showed you. My next point is about hedging. Hedging means that as researchers, we are not always 100% sure. And when we want to report the limits of our findings or protect ourselves from error, we will use three different types of hedging. Hedging means, again, to show approximation, chabudor, probability, doubt, or to limit the scope of the statement. I want to show this is not 100% sure or 100% true 100% of the time, and so I will use some hedging word, especially in my discussion section. Very important in this part of the paper. Now, I have a list of hedging words. These are great words. And please remember this list, because when you are writing your discussion and you don't know 100% if it's true, then you need to use one of these words. For example, an adjective, apparent. Apparent means it appeared to me, but maybe not to you, right? I don't know for sure. Consistent with means chabudo, but not exactly, right? Or most, possible, presumed, probable, several, some, supposed, or an adverb. About, apparently, arguably, fairly, in general, perhaps, possibly, presumably, probably, quite, rather, or a noun. Appearance, indication, likelihood, possibility, suggestion, tendency. Or a verb, and these are maybe the most common. Aim, appear, assume, can, could, estimate, indicate, infer, intend, may, might. These ones we use all the time in our discussion section. Uh, presume, propose, seem, should, speculate. All of these means I think, but I don't know, right? And they're very important to help separate the fact from the implication from what is true to what I think is true but cannot prove, especially in the discussion. Now, let me introduce you to maybe the most common, most popular of the tentative words. We call these the modal, the modal. They are might, could, may, should, would, and will. Might means 20% chance. Could. 30%, may, 40%, should, 60%, would, 85%, 
will 95%, all right? So you, you use the word that best reflects your confidence. The percentages, I just said those. I mean, you won't find those in the dictionary, but I just want you to remember that might is weaker than could, is weaker than may, is weaker than should, is weaker than would, is weaker than will. And I want you also to remember that should has a very special function in the discussion section. When you say should, you mean we advise often, we suggest. Doctors should remember to means we advise doctors remember to. This is a, a, a kind of a double function for this one modal should. Now the problem is sometimes students will use too many tentative words. And when they use more than one, it looks like we have too much doubt and we know nothing at all. So maybe possible. You can say possible or may, but don't say both. Or seems to suggest. Seems to or suggest, but not both. Rather, likely, to indicate. Oh, say rather or likely or indicate, but don't say all of them together. Or maybe seen as rather likely. Okay, say maybe or seen as or rather or likely, but when you stack them together, it just becomes too tentative and your reviewer thinks that you're wasting his time, okay? So one, one is enough. Let me show you some examples of this. Here's a, a sentence. A possible cause is likely the apparent tendency of a certain number of patients with diabetes to develop indications. Now, just too many tentative words. We don't need them. Better, a possible cause is the tendency. That's enough. We're going to put two in there rather than the original five that we had in the first sentence. Let me say a second type of hedging that we do not like. Sometimes when students are writing their paper, they don't want to start their sentence with we, so they begin their sentence with it, like it was apparent, it has been noted, it was decided, it is known to be, and I always think, who knows this? Who decided this? Who knows this? I have no idea. We are missing our subject, and it is not your subject. Let me tell you, this is the worst thing you can do. It is so much better to say we know it. Much, much, much better than to put this ugly, dirty pronoun at the beginning of your sentence. It is awful. And some style guides in medicine specifically forbid this. I showed you before an example in one of the style guides. Journal of Trauma and Disassociation. They don't allow those it sentences. Those it sentences avoid naming a subject. They avoid mentioning who the subject is. They're very unclear. If your sentence begins with it, please rewrite your sentence. You can do better. I'm sure it is not your subject. There's another subject somewhere. Try to find it and put it at the beginning of your sentence, even if it's we. Much better to say we than it. Here's an example. It was concluded that sleep deprivation has three effects on cognitive performance. And I think, who concluded? I have no idea. It did not conclude. It is not a thing. You are a thing. You can conclude. We concluded would be much better than you. The last way you can hedge, and I don't suggest this way either, is something called apologetic quotation marks Sometimes we call them ironic quotation marks. When we use this, it means we use a word and we put quotation marks around the word because we want the reader to know it's not real, it's fake, not true. For example, many patent medicines in the 1800s contain little more than alcohol and water. The writer is trying to say, this is not a real medicine. So he's saying, quote, medicine. AMA does not like this. They said, do not use the apologetic quotation marks. Trust the reader will find out by himself whether it's real or not. So according to AMA, they don't like this. They don't like starting a sentence with it. The only one they like is using the hedging word. Like it, may, should, could, those are fine. Those are appropriate. But when you use them, 
don't use too many, right? Only use one or two. So here's my summary on hedging. Don't use any extra qualifiers, those, those hedging words that I showed you. Use the active voice whenever possible, especially don't start your sentence with it. A terrible way to hedge. And finally, don't use the apologetic quotation marks. Avoid them, AMA forbids them. They usually confuse more than help. I now want to talk about pronouns. Now, I mentioned before that pronouns are not your friend. They are your enemy. Cut them where you can. And the reason they're so dangerous is that you always know what you mean and nobody else knows. Nobody else can guess what it, they, them, that, which means. Let me show you some examples. The second study was designed to enroll 2,000 more participants than the first study. It tested three dose levels of the study drug. Now, the PhD student knows what it means, but do you know if it's the first study or the second study? Is it clear which study it is referring to? No, it could be either one, right? We don't know. Of course, she knows because it's her study, so it's very clear to her that it is the second or first study, but the reader doesn't know what you know. You would have to rewrite this. You could say the second study, comma, which tested three dose levels of the study drug, comma, was designed to enroll 2,000 more participants than the first study. No pronoun here. That's fine. Or you could say the second study, comma, designed to enroll 2,000 more participants than the first study, tested three drug, uh, dose levels of the study drug. No claim. They're both fine, but you're going to try to avoid that, that pronoun here. Let me show you another example. Smith compared their study results with those of previous researchers and presented them at the conference. Did they present the previous researchers? That's possible. My colleagues. Or did they present their study results? I don't know. Not here, here. Because there's two possible nouns that the pronoun could refer to. And whenever there's two, there's one too many. We want to make sure there's only one possible noun every pronoun can refer to. Better, at the conference, Smith presented their study results, comma, which they had compared with those of previous researchers. Now it's much clearer. I know they're presenting their results, not the other researchers. So to fix this, I'm going to call ambiguous, unclear, antecedent. You can remove the pronoun, shorten the sentence, or rearrange the sentence element. The next one is a missing antecedent. Missing antecedent means there's a pronoun, but actually there's no previous noun for the pronoun to refer to. Let me show you an example. After reading the nursing professor's recent publication on patient care, the students contacted her to obtain more information. The pronoun is her. But who is her referring to? The nursing professor's publication? There is no nursing professor, right? There's only her publication. This error happens a lot when you have the possessive, like this right here. Often, the pronoun actually doesn't have a clear referent. The publication is the only noun. The nursing professor is not a noun. Only her publication is in the previous sentence. Uh, in the previous uh, section, so it's unclear. To fix this, you could say, after reading the recent publication on patient care by their nursing professor, okay, now I have that. The students contacted her. That's fine. That's fine. Or Johnson, maybe that's her name. That's even better. Or the student contacted the nursing professor to obtain more information after reading her recent publication on patient care. They're all fine, but try to avoid 
having a pronoun when there's actually not a clear noun to refer to, as we have here. My last pronoun error is called vague, the vague or unclear antecedent. Let me show you an example. This came from my, uh, my NTU class. One of my students wrote this sentence. She said, patients with a latent infection may need to be monitored for several months because they are at risk of developing the active form of the disease. This diminishes over time. Now, what's the problem here? Where, where's the pronoun? What is the pronoun? This, right? Now, what does this mean? Does this mean the need to be monitored or the risk of developing the active form of the disease or both? I don't know. There are three different possibilities. So I told the student, we have to rewrite this, we have to fix it. So she said, okay, which diminishes over time? Did we solve the problem? No, we just changed the pronoun from this to which. That solves nothing. We need to rewrite a little bit more. And this is a good principle. Whenever you say this or which, it's much better to follow this by telling us this what. Let me show you an example. Patients with a latent infection may need to be monitored for several months because they're at risk of developing the active form of the disease, period. This risk diminishes over time. Okay, now I know. Or the need to monitor these patients diminishes over time. Okay, now I know. Or as the risk diminishes over time, so too does the need to monitor these patients. Now I know it's both of them. Even though it seems very obvious to you because you wrote the paper, please tell us because we don't know. We don't know and so we want to be extra clear. This what? Tell us what it is. My next error is about the misplaced modifier. Now this happens when we put the a word in the sentence before the wrong word, before the word it should not be modifying. And this happens especially with almost and even and although. Well, almost and even in particular. Let me show you an example. In this example, I have the same sentence four times, but I move the word only. That's my modifier. And I want you to notice how my meaning changes when I change the position of the word only. In the first sentence, only eradication of this disease can be achieved through immunization. When you put only before eradication, you mean eradication and no other outcome. You're emphasizing eradication. Eradication is the point, is the focus. Look at it if we move it. Eradication of only this disease. That means this disease and no other disease. If we move only, eradication of this disease can only be achieved. That means achievement and no other outcome can occur. Or eradication of this disease can be achieved only through immunization. It means immunization is the only way. So you see how we are changing our meaning by changing this word. Be very careful with the placement of only and almost and even, because those words will radically change your sentence. And try to remember to put your word right in front, right in front of the word it modifies. And then your reader will know exactly what you mean. They were only asking about the deliverable. They were asking only about the deliverable. They, only they, were asking about the deliverable. Again, three different meanings depending on where we place the word only. Another grammar problem that I want to mention. Do not put a comma before but also in a sentence with not only but also. Not only, but also is a grammar pattern 
that we call a correlative conjunction. What that means is they are a team, and they must be ichi, together. They don't like to be separated by a comma. If you separate them with a comma, they lose their power and their meaning. So, for example, we observed that poor drug U efficiency was due to not only lack of absorption, comma, but also increased clearance. Do we like this? We do not, because we are separating those how punyos, not only, but also. They always like to go together and do not like to be separated with a comma. No comma there. Radiotherapy is valuable not only in reducing the number of courses of chemotherapy, but also producing superior overall survival. Do we like to see the comma here? Never. Not only, but also. Must go together. And, um, or and nor are another one uh, that ha cannot be uh, separated with the comma. Hyphens. Let me say something quickly about this one. Hyphens will create a new compound word. For example, look at this, 24-hour reactions or 24-hour reactions. You see the difference in meaning here? When you put a hyphen, you create a new compound word and a new meaning. Now, one mistake I often see with hyphen is, remember, never put a hyphen after L-Y, because L-Y actually means hyphen. So you see this intensely colored crystal has the same meaning as intense colored crystals, same. So we never say intensely colored crystals because that's hyphen hyphen, basically. So L-Y means hyphen, so does a hyphen mean a hyphen, so don't put them. So here's a couple of errors I see. Fully automated method to estimate the position of the diaphragm. Do we like this? No, we don't need that hyphen between fully automated. Or the surgically removed tissue specimen. Do we need a hyphen after surgically? We do not. Surgically removed. Don't use the same or similar words in a quick succession in two consecutive sentences. Let me show you what I mean. The baseline characteristics are shown in Table 1, period. Table 2 shows the body temperature of all female subjects. We don't like to start our sentence and end it, or end our sentence and start with the same one that Table 1, Table 2. Instead, the baseline characteristics are shown in Table 1, comma, and the body temperature of all female subjects are shown in Table 2, period. We separate them, or Table 1 and Table 2 show, that's fine, the baseline characteristics and body temperature of all female subjects, respectively. After the break, I'm going to talk about how to use respectively because, oh my goodness, people just kill me with the respectively. And I want to show you how to use it correctly. correctly. Here's another example of beginning and ending with the same word, which we don't want to see. Ablation of the lung tumors was approved by our Institutional Review Board. The Institutional Review Board also approved. So we have IRB, IRB, you know, right together. And it's ugly. It reads poorly. So we will rewrite it. Our IRB approved. And then just say both of them together. That would be it. Do not begin a sentence with a numeral. A numeral is a mathematical number, right? So 24 patients were assigned. We would never do that. We would instead write out the word 24 because it's the first word in a sentence or a total of. I think that's why we have a total of, just to avoid starting sentences with numerals. A total of 24 and 30 patients were assigned. 60%, do we like this? No, 60% more of the enrolled subjects. 60% continued their participation. I want to say something quickly about Asian fonts. 
When you write your paper, you're probably using a Chinese font like Simsum or Minchu. And those are very good fonts for writing Chinese, but they are not great for writing English. So I suggest that you change to a traditional English font like Times New Roman or Arial, because the problem is the Chinese fonts have a lot of problem with spacing, especially around the parentheses. You see here, temperature was increased. There's actually no space there, but that's crazy space between the degree symbol, you know, and I find that around the mathematical symbols and the parentheses, many times the spacing is very odd. But when you just change it all to Times New Roman, this problem will go away and it will look it will look much more normal. I'm going to take a quick break, 10 minutes. Don't run away, come back, because I have a lot of words that are misused, wrongly used. I want to go through my list of words and show you which ones you can use, which ones you can't, and when you can use them in different situations. Let's take 10 minutes and we will finish up our time together. And this doesn't have to be so. I suggest that you write carefully, look, try to avoid these mistakes, and then have someone to revise your paper. It doesn't even have to be me. It can be anybody to revise your paper. Another student in your lab will be better at revising your paper than you will. You are the worst person to edit your own paper because you always know what you mean. That's the problem. And because you know, even if there's an error, your own knowledge will fill in your gap. The curse of knowledge, we talked about that. So have, ideally have a, a colleague, a classmate, someone to review, to revise, before you send it out. Because even if their English is poor, their English is poor in a different way than yours is poor. And you will, he will help you to find some of your English mistakes, he will also help you to fill in some of the logic mistakes that you made. Have someone review. Have someone read your work. It is important. Let me talk about some other common errors now. The word acute. I've seen this word misused, and it is usually misused to mean severe. Students think that acute means severe, but acute symptoms severe symptoms. However, the word acute does not mean severe, it means short term. And the opposite of acute is chronic or long term. So for example, uh, an acute asthma attack in a chronic asthma patient. The attack is short term, but he has had asthma for a long time, right? So we just mean short and long. That's the key point with acute and chronic. Since and because the AMA has a rule for almost 10 years now, they say do not use since to mean because. The reason is since has the double meaning of time or cause. This can be very confusing. So, for example, he had wanted to be a biologist since he was 12 years old. You don't know if it's because he's 12 years old or since the time when he was 12 years old. Do you see the problem there? So AMA now says only use since if you mean time, and if you mean cause, say because. Never say since. Since the data were incomplete, the paper could not be published. Is it because the data is incomplete or since the time when the data was incomplete? I don't know. So if it's time, since is correct. But if you mean because, then say because the data was incomplete. Uh, some more examples. The study could not be performed since the equipment malfunctioned. Is it because the equipment malfunctioned or since the time when the equipment malfunctioned? If it is time, since is good. If it's cause, say because the equipment malfunctioned. Incidents and prevalence are commonly confused. Incidents and prevalence are both used to measure their statistical measures of disease occurrence in a population. But the thing I'd like you to remember, and you probably already know this, but incidence refers to the new cases 
and prevalence recur, uh, refers to all the cases, right? All of the cases, the total cases at any time. So the prevalence rate for asthma increased uh, from 34 cases per 100,000 to 40 cases per 100,000. Is this correct? Are we talking about only new cases or are we talking about all cases? It, it should be the incidence rate. We're talking about the new cases per 100,000 here, so we would say incidence. The incidence of HIV in young adults age 21 to 24 was 0.1 percent. Is this all the cases or only new cases? All the cases, so we would say prevalence here, the prevalence of all the cases in the population. Uh, less and fewer. We use less for the singular and the non-countable nouns, and we use fewer for the plural countable nouns. You see uh, water or mass, non-countable, and then let me give you an example. The patient reported drinking fewer water this week. Is that correct? No. Can we count water? We cannot. So it would be less water. But what if you want to count the water? What can you do? You can put the water in a glass, can't you? And you could say, could you say this? The report of the patient reported drinking less glasses of water. Is that correct? No, you can count the glasses. So we would say fewer glasses of water. Effect and effect. A very common problem, and I really want to talk about this. They are not the same, and I often see them used as if they are the same, but effect is much weaker than effect. Affect means to influence, and when you say affect, you are saying influence, maybe positively, maybe, maybe negatively. It's not clear, but there is an influence. When you say affect with an A, it could be more than one influence. It could be just one small part of a much bigger group of influences. But when you say effect, you mean it caused it by itself, 100%. So it's a much stronger word. Let me show you an example. <clears throat> the addition of this to cultured rat cells affected polyglutamate formation. Now, if you say affected, it means it could have either increased it or decreased it, and maybe other things were also there, also affecting. But when you say the addition of this to cultured rat cells affected polyglutamate formation, uh, formation, you mean it caused it by itself. So. Pay careful attention to your thing. Affect, influence, slight, up or down, or effect, to cause, to cause. Interval and period. Um, in the method section, it's particularly important to get these words correct. They are not the same. When you say interval, you mean the time between events. Let's think of it as doing nothing time, waiting time. And if you're doing something, you say period. That's doing something time. So doing nothing time, waiting, is an interval. Doing something time, mixing, stirring, injecting, whatever, that's a period. That's a period. So um, in your methods, if you're waiting for something to happen, it's an interval, a time interval. If you're doing something or there's an activity going on, it's a period. Can and may are not the same. Can refers to the power or ability to do something. I can jump up and down. Right? I have the power, the ability to do it. May means I don't, it's not about my ability, it's possibility, probability, outside my control. It may rain today. I don't know if it will or not. I have no power to control the weather. So outside of my control. May, may. Another common mistake I see is popular and common. Now, the word common and popular are often confused. When we say popular, we mean people love it, like pop music, popular music. When you say common, we mean it happens a lot, but we don't know if people like it or not. We're not saying whether they like it. In medical writing, we usually always say common, almost never, never popular. That's a very un uncommon word to use. But let me just show you an example. 
strain of the AC, uh, ACL of the knee is a popular injury among voodoo practitioners. This looks like everybody loves to be injured. Yes, we like to strain our ACL. That is just so fun. I'm sure that's not true. It is a common, a common injury among voodoo practitioners. Or here's another uh, example. Cancer was the most popular cause of death in this population it means everybody loves cancer, and I'm sure that's not true. It was the most common cause of death. Generally, we always say common. I mean, I can't really think of a good use for popular. If you're using the word popular a lot, you're probably doing something wrong um, in your paper. Oh, here's a word I particularly don't like. <laughs> Respectively. Here's why I hate this word so much. Sometimes my students in my medical writing class give me this crazy long list, like crazy long, and then they say, respectively. <laughs> respectively means try to decode my crazy list. Good luck. You know, and this, this is not how we use respectively. Remember, when we write, we want to be clear. We want to be clear, number one. And number two, we want to be short. When you use respectively, you can be shorter, but sometimes you are very unclear. And I want you to remember being clear is more important than being short. And so if we are sacrificing clarity for shortness, we are making a mistake. Let me show you, let me tell you the rule about respectively. When you use the word respectively, you can say a total of four things. A, B, A, B, respectively. That's it. Four. A, B, A, B. You cannot say A, B, 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 respectively. You also cannot say A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, respectively. Just four. If you have more items, then write more sentences, but you can't use the word respectively to do it. Let me show you an example here. Air and hydrogen detector flows for the first run and the second run were set at 85 and 4 milliliters respectively. So we have AB, AB, AB. You see that? We have six items here. I have air and hydrogen, first run, second run, 85 and 4. And then he puts respectively. Too many. Remember the rule? Only four. So I will rewrite this sentence and I will cut out the first run and the second run because honestly nobody cares about that. And I will say, Air and hydrogen detector flows were set at 85 and 4 milliliters, respectively. That's fine. A, B, A, B, done. Respectively is okay. Here's another one. Samples for this and this analysis were weighed between 0.55 and 0.60 milligrams into silver cups and 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams into tin cups, respectively. Here I have A, B, C, A, B, C, right? I have... It's too many. It's six items, but I can only do it because I'm doing two samples, two different measurements, and two types of cups, silver and tin. Better, I will rewrite this without respectively. Samples for this were weighed between that and two silver cups, and samples for this were weighed between this and two tin cups. You see, my sentence is a little bit longer, but it is much clearer. So I'm okay to be longer, if I can be clearer. I will not sacrifice clarity for being short. I've got to be both. I've got to be both. And clarity comes first. So we will do this. The word etc., another word I pretty much hate. Here's why I hate etc. Many times my students will write a long list and then put etc. And that means, try to guess what other things are in my mind. Good luck. Again, this is not a good use of the word etc. Etc. is only used when your reader exactly knows what is coming next. That's the key point. For example, numbers divisible by 2 are 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, etc. You, you know what's coming next. That's fine. But if you just give me two or three examples and then put etc., I don't know what other examples you may have. So don't use it for examples. Don't use etc. for what we call incomplete lists. Incomplete lists. You can still give me an incomplete list, but you just can't use etc. Let me give you. Let me show you here. 
The two groups of data were compared using a variety of statistical methods, including a t-test, chi-squared analysis, etc. I don't know what other kinds of tests he means. I have no idea. But he doesn't need to put etc. because he uses the word including. When you say including, I always know there are more. This is an incomplete list. Including means incomplete list. So that's fine. This is involved in substrate binding in most hydrolysis, including this, 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 etc. Do we need etc. here? No, we don't. Why? Because I already have including, right? It's not necessary to put etc. here. Etc. is redundant. It means nothing. If you put it there, you will confuse people because they think they should know what else you're thinking, and actually they shouldn't know. A, B, and C, etc. No, such as. That's the other thing you can do. You can say including or such as. Both of them mean incomplete list. Both of them mean these are examples and there are more. Physical factors, joint laxity, knee muscular force, etc. I don't know what else he's thinking. So if it's an incomplete list, better to say such as or including. Both of those are fine for incomplete list. Let me talk about the difference between such as and namely, because they're both important and they have a strong function in medical writing. They mean different things. When you say such as, you mean an incomplete list, as I mentioned. When you give examples, you can say such as. However, when you are exactly defining something or giving me a complete list, say namely. Namely means I'm going to name all of them. I'm going to tell you everything, not just some, all. I will define it exactly. Other factors, such as nutrient status, primary, uh, primary production, microbial biomass, and coagulation processes. Other factors, such as, here I know it's, there's more. This is uh, only examples. But here I have an example of namely, calibrated against certified reference materials, namely, I'm going to name both of these materials. That means these are their names and there are no more. Just two. That's it. This is not an incomplete list. This is all of them. I am telling you everything. So, such as, examples, namely, everything. Now I want to talk about another two terms, e.g. and i.e. And honestly, I, if I were you, I would avoid using either one. Many times in my class, students have no idea what these mean, and they just use them randomly. Today's Tuesday, I'm going to use EG, and on Wednesday, I will say IE. I mean, it's just so random. Let me just try to tell you that EG means such as, and IE means namely. Okay, so there you go. And I would rather you say such as and namely than EG and IE, just because EG and IE are kind of misunderstood by many readers. And such as and namely are just more formal. They're just more formal. But if you really want to use EG, remember, EG means examples. There are more. And IE means definition. This is everything. This is all of it. Change in height, e.g., height velocity, may be reduced in asthmatic children. Now, this author, when he says e.g., he actually doesn't want to give an example of height. He wants to define height. So he should say i.e. When you want to exactly tell us, this is such as, this is namely, you should be saying namely. This is exactly the type of height that I'm talking about. I am defining it for you. Or here, another mistake. These have been implicated in specific pathological states. And then he puts example, but actually he wants to define what those specific states are. So it would be better for him to say IE here or name. Let me talk about that and which for a minute here. What is the difference? When do we use them? I think the best thing to do is give an example. Let me try to say this without using the gram grammatical language here. Um, the samples 
That showed a change in uh, D2H between precursor and product were analyzed. That means that not all the samples showed a change. Those that did were analyzed. So when you say that, you mean some of them, not all of them. When you say which, you mean all of them. Let me change it. The samples, comma, which showed a change, means all the samples showed a change. So whenever you are following your word with that or which, try to think, are all of them affected or only some of them? If I'm trying to say that some were and some weren't, say that. If all were, say comma, which. Never put comma before that, and always have a comma before which. Among and between. You hear the word to in between, the English word twice, twix, to, between. Between is always to. And if it's more than two, it is among, among. Let me show you an example here. The only difference is among the precursor molecules and the product molecules. Now, I only have two here, so I should say between. That's right. Significant differences were observed in values between bio, fully, and semi-synthetic epinephrine. Do we have, how many do we have? We have three, can I say between? I cannot, I must say among. Among is for more than two. Do not use at for days. I correct this a lot in medical papers. We use at for time. And we use in for a month, and we use on for a day. Now, this is true uh, for time. It's also true for a space. For example, I am in Taipei. Taipei is a big place, right? And then when you add one line in the space, you put on, on Chang'an Chilu. And then when you put another line, I am at uh, an address, for example, Iba Basha Hao, at. A particular address. So in an area on one line, when you add a second line, you are at. Now the same is true for time. We are in the month of, uh, what is this, July, right? On, what is today? The 29th, at, what is the time? 2.30, right? So in, on, a day, a calendar, day, and then at a time. So both for, for the physical space and for the time, we do that in, on, at. Let me show you some examples. Graph rejection was observed at day 115 and 125. Do we like this? We do not because a day should be on. It's on a day. It's only at a time. Significant recovery was observed at day 7. On. Remarkable and marked. There is an important difference here, and I, I don't know how this started, but the word remarkable means how fun, fantastic, wonderful, terrific, and as serious scholars, we don't, we should not get so excited uh, about our findings. Usually what we want to say is it's marked, means that we can mark it. It was here and now it's here. So rather than remarkable, fantastic, it is marked. Generally, that's the correct term you probably want to use. There was a remarkable increase in binding. No, there was a marked increase in binding. Well, I'm going to open it up for questions, and if there are none, I have some extra information that I want to share with you. Before we do that, I want to refer you to our Facebook. I wrote a lot of articles in Chinese about many writing errors. I mentioned a few today, but I have a lot more on my website or on my blog. We edit papers. We edit a lot of papers for TNU. You guys are some of our biggest customers. Thank you for all the papers. Uh, if you need help with editing or translation, we are happy to help you. I have, uh, we now receive 32 papers a day from all over Taiwan in, the Ta in our office in Taipei, and I have got uh, 47 and the editing team, the translation team, just revising papers every day. We're 
really good at preparing papers to publish in the international journals. Do we have any questions about medical writing based on what we talked about today? Your one team on? Okay, if we don't, then I'm going to use my extra time because I still have a few minutes because I want to talk about how to use the verb tense in medical papers. I wasn't sure if I would have the time today, and I have the time, and I'm very happy, because this is an important topic. Many times, when I'm reading medical papers, I see authors using the wrong verb tense, and I want to talk about the function of the past, present, and future tense in medical papers. First, in medical writing, when do we use the past tense? In general, we use the past tense for what happened one time in the past and we finished happening. It happened once and now it's over. That's past tense. For example, your results. They happened one time in the past. They're not still happening now. And so we use the past tense. Let's talk about the future tense, the, the present tense. What do we use the present tense for? We use the present tense for the fact, for something always true, for something with continuing applicability. And that's why we don't write our results in present tense. We saw our results one time, but that does not mean they are a fact forever. I mean, we hope they are a fact forever, but we ourselves will not say that in our own research paper. We will be modest and use the simple past tense to talk about our previous work. The other reason why we must use the past tense is we want to show sequence. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. If you use the present tense, everything's happening right now, and you can't show any tense, you can't show any sequence. So simple past tense for your results. Your methodology will be in past tense. When do we use the future tense? We use the future tense for something that we plan to do in the future, for something that we are proposing. And one mistake that I see is sometimes Students will write their methodology in the future tense. This will be. The problem is, it looks like the whole paper is a proposal and we do nothing. And the reviewer may reject us and say, please send us your research when you finish. Well, maybe you did finish, but you used the wrong tense. So make sure to use the simple past tense for your own method. I'm going to go through the paper and give you examples of different sections of the paper to help you understand how to use verb tense from the introduction, method, results, and discussion. I want to make you very comfortable, very familiar with using the verb tense in your own paper. Oh, before we continue, there's one other tense. Past tense for what happened one time, present tense for fact, future tense for proposal, but there's another tense called present perfect tense. Previous research has found, has discovered, has indicated. When we use present perfect tense, we mean the action happened more than one time before. And whenever you're writing your literature review, and you're talking about more than one study, you must have more than one time, right? It couldn't happen all at the same time. So whenever in your literature review you have multiple studies, more than one study, then you must always say studies have found, have indicated. Use that present perfect tense for multiple studies. That's very common because multiple times in your literature review. Let me... Uh, talk about the introduction. The introduction to the paper has five steps. Five steps. Step one is called motivation. And in the motivation, that's the first paragraph of your medical paper, you will tell people why your study is important. And this is, you must do this because if no one thinks your paper is important, they will not read your paper. 
So here in the beginning, you're trying to say, look, this is an important problem. I'm not wasting your time. So please read more, all right? You're going to say uh, the history of the problem or previous studies or what they did and what they didn't do. You're going to emphasize why it's important. The second paragraph of your medical paper will start what we call our literature review. Now, the literature review will talk about the previous studies. And the goal of your literature review is to create stage three, the knowledge gap. You will say what other people did so people will understand what nobody did, right? Usually it will be Johnson did X and Smith did Y, but nobody did M. You know, you're going to build around your gap right here in the middle of what you plan to do. That will bring you to the problem statement, or we call this the objective. This is what we want to do. And then finally, many medical papers have a short rationale for study. If we can solve this problem, it'll be so great. You know, a little sentence like that at the end of our introduction. So let me start in the first stage and give you an example sentence. Here's the first sentence, and you notice that, this is the motivation, the author uses the present tense. Motor skills require action based on rapid change in the environment. Now, why does he say present tense, require? Because this is a fact. It's always true. So because it's always true, he uses the present tense. Look at the second sentence. Clean water is a basic human need. Does anyone want to argue with that? I mean, we no, that's a fact, and so we use the present tense. Many times when we are writing our paper, we see many studies have proven something, and so we assume it's a fact, and when we think it's a fact, we will use the present tense. But this is sometimes a little bit of a judgment on your side. Maybe some people will disagree that it's a fact, but you as the author will decide in your own sentence by sentence whether to use present tense, fact, or past tense. Past tense means it may be true, I don't know. It happened one time, but possibly not always true. So this is a little bit of a judgment that you will make when you are writing your motivation. Look at this last one. This is another way that we begin our papers. Previous studies, studies have uh, indicated. I'm using present perfect tense, have indicated, not indicated. Why? Because more than one study, right? More than one study means more than one time. So present perfect tense for multiple studies in our literature review or in our motivation here in our paper. In the literature review, there are three different types of tense we could use depending on what we are doing. Look at the first one. I'm called this uh, information prominent. Maybe the best way is to say fact. This is a fact, okay? If you have a fact in your introduction, which tense do we use? Who remembers? Fact uses the present tense, right? It's always true. In most deserts of the world, Transitions between topographic elements are, present tense, abrupt. Even though this is a study in the past, the author believes it's always true. So he's going to use the present tense. Now, here's a, a multiple study citation. Several researchers, that means more than one, have studied, not studied, have studied, the relationship between classroom adjustment and mobility. Smith, Madsen, Williams. Three authors, three times, present perfect tense, right? Three studies. If you have one study with several authors, that's still single study, past tense. But when you have more than one study, you have more than one time, and you will use the present perfect. The last one is single study, Allington found, one time, found, past tense, that teachers allocate equal time to all rules. In our literature review, I think this is the most common form we use. Most of the time, the previous study is not a fact, but it happened one time, so we will be using a lot of past tense 
throughout our introduction. Let me show you some variation on that uh, citation style. Johnson found that X affects Y. Johnson found that X affected Y. Johnson suggested that X may affect Y. All three are correct. All three mean different things. Notice that the first verb is always past tense because single study. Found, found, suggested. Past, past, past. For the, for the first verb. But the second verb, that's the one I want you to notice. Johnson found that X affects Y. Johnson's finding happened once before, but his results are a fact today. And because they're a fact, I will use present tense for my second verb in this sentence. Look at the second one. Johnson found that X affected Y. Here, I'm saying, I don't know if it's a fact. It's a result. It happened one time. So I'm using the past tense for the second verb. Look at the third one. Here, remember we talked about the hedging before? Suggest was a hedging word. Here, I'm saying Johnson suggested that X may affect Y. Johnson did not prove this. Johnson did not find this in his results. Johnson only suggested this in his discussion, right? This was one of Johnson's implications. And if Johnson says suggest in his paper, when you cite Johnson, you must also say suggest. Sometimes I see students changing the meaning of the paper they are citing because they change the verb. If he says suggest, don't say found. If he says suggest, don't say prove. Keep the same verb or you may change his meaning. So we will say suggested and we will say may. May means it's not a fact. I don't know. Also, he didn't know. So we will keep that same tentative word here. Stage three of the introduction is called the knowledge gap. And here we talk about what no previous study did. We are trying to show why we need our study. And here are a couple examples. However, few studies have reported. I love the word however for the knowledge gap because this word will stop the reader and he will see, okay, good, I will stop sign. Right here, here's the contribution. When students don't say however, or don't say but, or don't say although, or don't say despite, I don't see the knowledge gap, and sometimes I think, why are you writing this paper? The world is perfect already. We don't need it. Uh, so you really need to stop me and say, however, have reported. Now, why does, do we say have reported here? Who remembers? More than one study means more than one time, right? And so therefore, we use present perfect tense for multiple studies. The objective, this is step four of the introduction, and let me read this one first. The purpose of this study was to determine. Our objective is usually a two sentence, to identify, to determine, to propose, to something. Now, he says the study was, past tense. Why? Because your study is over now. Right? You finished. Not still happening. Whenever you talk about your study, was, investigation, was, research, was, past, past, past. However, when you talk about the paper, which is in your hand right now, or you talk about the figure, or you talk about the table, or you talk about the chapter or the section, it is, present tense. This is a rule of scientific writing. We have had it for like 100 years. It's kind of weird, I know. Just remember, the research is over, but the paper is right now. So look at this example. The aim of this paper is, because it's the document that you're talking about, you use the present tense. Also, even in your results, 
Table one shows. You see the present tense for the table, or the figure, or the chart. Anything in the document is the present tense. But the study, the results, are in the past tense. I'll give you other examples about table and figure in my slides. Uh, at the end of the introduction, we have something called mini implication. And it will go something like this. This research may provide an alternative. Now, I can't say this research provides, because that would be a fact, and I don't know, I hope. I also can't say uh, provided, no, that's past tense. I'm guessing here, I'm hoping here, but because I'm guessing, I will use the hedging word. Remember, the hedging word may, may provide an alternative. I told you about these already. After the introduction, we have our method section. And in the method section, when we are describing the conventional material, we will use the present tense. Now, conventional material means the untouched material, the unmodified material. When you modify the material, you use the past tense. I'll give you an example in a minute. When you're describing groups of people that you did not touch, you did not meet them, you use the fact, the present tense. But after you meet them, after you put them in your study, you use the past tense. So let's say that you are writing your medical paper, and in the beginning of your medical paper, we have a material and a method, right? We talk about what we use and then how we use them. When you begin to talk about your material, sometimes the material that you use, what you say about the material is a fact. It's always true. You're, maybe you're describing the properties of gold or the function of a body organ. And these things that you say about these materials are always true. But once you take a body organ or once you take gold or once you take a material and you begin to modify it, now it's part of your research and it becomes past tense. So a good rule is, before you touch something, what you say is present tense, it's a fact. But when you touch it, you own it, it's yours, and you're gonna talk about it in the past tense. Same for people. When you're describing all the people in Taiwan, what you say could be a fact, but when you take 50 of these people to be in your study, they are now your people, and what you say will be past tense. You'll just talk about them, this population, in the past tense. And then the rest of your methods will all be past tense. So the only part of your method section that will be present tense is materials, and only the untouched material. Once you touch the material, everything becomes past tense as you continue on when you're writing. Here's an example of the untouched or conventional material. A typical chemical reactor includes, uh, this is before I touch it, all right, this is the typical one, the untouched one. Present tense, includes. But when I touch it, it's mine, and I will use past tense. For the testing program, this collector was, past tense, was protected. I did it. Protected from weather by an outer window. Same for people. All students who apply for admission to Jiao Da take present tense, general population, the GEPT. But when I take some to be in my study, they're my people and they're past tense. The subjects were past tense, 18, my 18, Chinese speaking students attending Java. So if you don't touch the people, you can talk about them in the present tense, it's a fact. But when you take some, now they're part of your story, and they're past tense. And then the rest of your methods is all past tense. Stress was applied to the rubber segment. Now the results. When you are talking about the figures, when you're talking about the tables, it's in the document, and so it's present tense, right? Table one shows, figure two depicts, present tense. You can see it right now, Shinzaka. When you are presenting the findings, it will be past tense. When you're comparing your findings to other people's findings, you will say may, might, could, because you're guessing a little bit here. And when you're commenting on your findings, you will say may, might, could, 
because it's not a fact, it's your opinion. Let me show you an example. Results of the t-tests are presented in table one. Are presented right now. You can see it. You're reading my paper. If you look, you'll find it. Present tense. When you're presenting the findings, the results, these are past tense. As a group, divorced mothers spent, past tense, over twice as much time in employment as married mothers. The highest incidence of Otis Media was found. Prices showed. Dry rate of top growth was not highly related to past, 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 or your findings or your results. When you're comment, commenting on the findings, you will use the tentative word. Let me show you an example. Hyperactive children may be generally responsive to amphetamines. I mean, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe. Or, hyperactive children appear to be the same meaning. Appear, may, appear means to me, I think so, but maybe you don't think so. May also has that same meaning. I can use my modal or I can use a hedging word. Go play, means the same thing. When I'm limiting the findings, the sample was small. Other industries may produce different results. I'm not sure, so I will say that. The discussion, the last part of the paper. I will begin my discussion by referring back to the beginning, the purpose, the hypothesis, repeating the findings. All of this is past tense. Let me give you a few examples. This research, my research, attempted. I'm not going to say attempts because the attempting is over now, right? The research is over now. Attempted in the past, attempted to assess. We originally assumed. The assuming is over now. It's in the past now. I'm using the word we. Is that okay? Is it okay to use we? It's the discussion section. Remember the discussion section? We can use we. So that's all right. That's all right. When you're explaining the findings, let me show you a couple of interesting examples. These results indicate. Now, let me stop. Indicate. What does indicate mean? Indicate means to point. It means to suggest, to strongly suggest, indicate is not equal to find, not equal to show, not equal to prove. Indicate is a tentative word. We use this when we are not 100% sure. And this is the discussion. I will frequently use this word in my discussion. These results indicate that microbial activity caused, or these results indicate that microbial activity caused. So it could be cause or causes. Which one is correct? They're both correct. And here's the interesting thing. Because in the first example, my implication, cause, I mean only in my case, only in this study. But in the second one, causes, I'm, I'm being more universal in my implication. I'm thinking all the time that this probably happens. I'm broadening it by using the present tense in my second verb. When I'm comparing the findings, I'm using the present tense. These results are in substantial agreement with those of Bates. Finally, implications. Squatter housing markets appear to behave. Appear is that tentative word that we often use to mean I don't know for sure, but it looks like it to me. At the end of the discussion, we often have recommendations and applications. The approach outlined in this study should be replicated in other manufacturing plants, or we recommend that the approach outlined in this study be replicated. This is the same meaning. Remember I talked about the word should? I said should has a special meaning for recommend. So you can either say should or recommend. They both mean this is our suggestion to you. This is what we think you should do. How? <laughs> well, that's all the time that I have for you today. I appreciate you coming. I hope that you have great luck writing and publishing your medical paper. Thank you, and bye-bye.